Hello and welcome to this week's episode of Experience Shakespeare. I'm Cassie Cass, that Shakespeare girl. So today I'm here with the Carboys Homebrew Club from Hoover, Alabama to show you guys how to make 16th century ale. In Shakespeare's plays, many kinds of alcohol are mentioned or consumed. There's metheglin, wort, beer, ale, of course, sack, Falstaff was all about it. And the most famous Shakespeare reference to alcohol of all is probably the giant butt of Malmsey and Richard III for poor George, Duke of Clarence. Ale was a regular part of everyday life. John Shakespeare was the official ale taster for the town of Stratford-upon-Avon when William was growing up, and this was a well-respected position. He was basically the quality control officer. He would make sure that the ale being produced had the right ingredients, and that it was being sold at the crown-regulated prices. So by learning to make 16th century ale, you are literally getting a taste of William Shakespeare's history, which is why we're going to show you how to do it today. You want to learn more about ale and beer in the 16th century, please be sure to check out the episode of That Shakespeare Life. It's episode 20, where we interviewed Phil Withington on his book, Intoxicants in Early Modern England, all about why, answering mainly, how could you drink ale all day long with all of your meals and not walk around drunk all the time? We talked with him about what that would mean and why it didn't happen in that episode, so make sure you visit castycash.com slash episode 20. That's castycash.com slash EP20. Obviously for our episode today, we are updating a lot of the equipment and process to modern day standards for both health and safety for making this process. William Shakespeare would have used different kinds of implements, but for our 16th century process, we're focusing on the fact that it's the kind of ale Shakespeare would have drank, it includes the ingredients that he would have had, and we're updating the process because, well, we don't like things like plague that Shakespeare dealt with, and so we're doing it the safe and healthy way. Here you have to extract essentially sugar water from malted grains. So to do that first we need to heat up uh, water to add to our grains to make our mash. So here we have a typical uh, home brewer's grain mill and I've got about uh, two pounds of malt here. This is just um, malted barley and uh, in order for us to be able to uh, get the sugars out of this it has to be crushed uh, so that the water can saturate all the starches okay. and an enzymatic conversion process can happen to turn all those into sugar. So okay. that's what we're going to be doing here. It's just we've already got the bulk of the grains. So there's crushed. no granulated sugar that gets added to ale. It all comes from the malt? You can add adjuncts such as uh, granulated sugar or we're actually going to be adding some honey okay. today at the end. Okay. Um, you could add brewer syrup, uh, corn syrup. So it just depends on what kind of flavor that you want. That's right. Yeah, Shakespeare yeah. would not have used a drink. Right? I love it. Negative. Oh, it smells. You can, it. Smell you can crank it. it by hand, but, you know, that requires extra effort. Yeah. We have some ale malt. Uh, some amber malt, which is just kilned a little more during the drying process to darken it. And we have a little bit of unmalted old oats here. And this will still get converted into uh, sugars. The uh, enzymes in the malted grain will convert this as well. So is Carboys a group that people can join? Like people can come and, is that what you'll do? Is you learn how to make the Carboy Junkies is a local homebrew club here in Birmingham, very casual. Typically meet monthly to share some of our brews. We do hard cider, wine, kombucha, anything that involves the fermentation process. And I actually heard you talking on your intro earlier about methyl again, yes. which is part of my interest because that's something a couple of us have tried our hand at in the past. Yeah, that shows <laughs> up in Love's Labor's Lost. The character Byron lists off methyl again, wart, and ale in that passage. You guys make that? You make Malmsey? I have to ask. That's the one from Richard III. Haven't tried that. <laughs> yep. Well, I hear you're supposed to store it in a giant butt and it's useful for drowning your enemies. Ah. <laughs> want the grains to sit at about 150 degrees Fahrenheit uh, for around an hour. Um, that will allow those uh, starches to fully convert the sugars during the night. Yeah, go for it. Yeah. 
And that's just hot water. We didn't put anything in that. Uh, to be, well, we added a little bit of uh, mineral to the mash here. Oh um, my goodness. Just to treat the water to help acidify the mash. Um, other than that, there was nothing else in the water. Which mineral? Calcium chloride. Double, so double, the idea is you want to just kind of uh, <laughs> Fire it around cold. and uh, scoop up from the bottom as well to make sure there's no dough clumps. Okay, so i got to stir it right not just scoop it back. <laughs> Brewing 16th century ale involves a lot of doing and then sitting and waiting. So now that we've mixed the mash with hot water, it has to sit and extract those sugars that Jay was talking about. While we were stirring up the first pot of hot water that got added to the mash, we boiled a second pot. And each time, minerals are being added to the water to make sure that it's at the right level. And so we added more water, filled it up to a certain level, and then it has to sit for about one hour. But what is wort? Wort is what we're making right now in the mash. It's uh, essentially just diluted malt syrup. It's the sugar water that we're extracting from the grains. That's all the work. That is not at all it's scary. unfermented beer. No. <laughs> like, you think of it as, I'm going to add this, this witch's thing. Do you not think of this as, like, part of witch's brew? It's not scary. Yeah. Now, not to be confused with some herbs delicious. and flowers that might have, be, be called something. Okay. So, I, I read, and I don't know if this is true or not, but that um, wormwood and mugwort used together. So, if you drink enough of it, you're going to be kind of, you know, loopy. A lot of it got blamed on the uh, wormwood because the, um, the chemical in there that makes it really bitter, the thujone, in high enough quantities can be hallucinogenic. <laughs> Look, I found this. Okay, so like in, in Love's Labor's Lost, Rosalind says to weed this wormwood from your fruitful brain. They knew this did this. And it even says it has a bitter taste. In Rape of Lucrece, Shakespeare says, It's incredibly bitter. The sugar tongue to bitter wormwood taste. Learn something new every day. The more you know, learn something new about Shakespeare. One of the ingredients that we're using today, Heather, uh, we had read somewhere that um, when it was used for possibly brew it, that would, they would pick a wild, and it could have uh, a fungus that would grow on it that could possibly be hallucinogenic. It sounds a lot to me like turgot, which is active component that they make lysergic acid from or LSD. <laughs> I was joking. <laughs> You're not supposed to go and tell me that it's a real thing. Now we find out that Shakespeare's ale could have also made so That's when he wrote a bit summary. Well, what we'll do before we drain, we'll do a process called a Borloff, which is where you drain out um, a little bit of the wort into uh, just like another vessel and pour it back in kind of recirculate it for a little bit. Okay. That sets the grain bed as a natural filter and allows it to kind of strain the thicker chunks of ash in the grain out on its own. To complete the Vorloff process, they would drain off part of the liquid from the mash into like a quart-sized bucket and then slowly pour it back into the top. Being slow and not splashing it was key. We repeated this process two to three times until the gunk and the pieces stopped coming out of the liquid. We don't want to disturb the grain bed now. We're trying to keep that settled so that when we do this one or two more times, it's not kicking, it's not undoing what we just did. We're trying to set the grain bed so that this pours um, somewhat clear and not chunky. So they said this boils for an hour, and at about the 30 minute mark, we're gonna put together the gruit and add that in there. And the gruit is the herb mixture that adds all the different flavors, and so we'll get to see them mix that up. Here's some of the different herbs that would have been used traditionally for gruit. Um, we've got dried mugwort, and this one's already measured out, so I'm not going to measure that one, but if you want to... I've never seen mugwort. Yeah. Uh, go ahead. You can smell it, taste it. Um, probably going to be a little bit bitter. Very bitter. I well, I actually it. tasted it straight up myself, and it's not, oh, okay. not that, that bitter on its own. Okay. Although flavor-wise, a little bit, it's kind of its own, a little bit difficult to describe. For me, it is. I feel like I've just set paper it's in my <laughs> Then we've got yarrow, which is very, I don't know, it's herbaceous smelling, but those are just dried, yar dried yarrow flowers. And these are all just plants that they ground up? Yeah, actually, uh, Stott's got yarrow flowers growing in his garden. I'm going to measure out an ounce. Okay. Yarrow None of these are dangerous in their own right. Uh, yarrow was used to treat oh, okay, wounds. Okay, perfect. 
the, it's going to uh, fly off. It's okay. also called Spearwell. And then this yeah. one's an ounce. This is called Labrador tea, yeah. but it's wild rosemary. Oh, okay. Which is not the same species as culinary rosemary, but it looks very similar in its, so it's in its own way. So it's a different kind of rosemary plant. And you're just putting an ounce of each one? For the for our initial addition, yes. What's this one? That is heather. And you're not putting it in there? I'm going to use that at the end. That's for the aromatic. Correct. Okay. As he measured out an ounce of each of the herbs, he added them to what is essentially a giant tea bag. It was a mesh cheesecloth type bag that's going to be clipped to the side of our wort and boiled to add the flavor. Time to add the brew. Okay. Yeah, if you want to just clip it to the side, be okay. very careful because the pot is very hot. That's how I burned my hand a couple weeks ago. Okay, so I just stick it in there? Mm -hmm. And then just clip it to the side of the, of the pot. Just like that? Just like that. Oh. Is your room changing? Yes. Yeah, oh yeah. You gotta whip the stain. Wow. Stick my head in that. It's wow. cool. <laughs> oh, it's great. Like I all like I get sage. It is like a bit very, sage. -y. Very sage. -y. I just reset a timer for 30 minutes. So by when that's done, it'll be 60 minute oil. The yeast will not thrive in a really hot wort. Um, it needs to be just under room temperature. That's the happy place for ale yeast. So we want to try to lower that temperature as quickly as possible. The cooling coil allows us to rapidly cool down the wort. And then once it's at a certain level, we can add the last ingredient, which is extra heather and some honey for an aromatic effect in the final ale product. Heather in there. Okay, yeah, go ahead. And this is wildflower honey? It is. It'll dissolve and mostly add some fermentables, but hopefully leave a little bit of honey flavor and aroma. Now that the aromatics have been added, it's time to put the wort into a carboy, which is this giant plastic container that looks like an enormous bottle. And they just drain the wort out of the pot into the carboy using a long tube that's connected from the kettle down into the neck of the bottle. And now it's ready to go from wort to ale by adding yeast. So, Cassidy, do us your honors. Oh, okay. Tell me what you expect, right? Uh, it's really easy. Just straight in? Just pour it in there? Just yeah. stir it. Do it. Swirl, Swirl it good, good and then just pour it straight in. There you go. There you go. Ta-da! You just made ale. We have ale. We do. Oh, that's exciting. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> So we'll come back, we made the ale, it's official, we have 16th century ale. We'll come back in three weeks and do the whole force carb, I don't know what that means, but they're gonna teach us. So come back for part two where we get to taste this. So if you haven't already, like and subscribe to the channel because you're gonna wanna stick around and see us taste the ale. All right, so this is about 29 hours after we pitched the yeast uh, yesterday on Sunday. You can see uh, there's lots of activity in the airlock. Uh, you can see um, there's a nice croissant that's already formed on the beer from fermentation and the yeast. The ale itself has turned a cloudy color that's from the active yeast being all stirred around. If you take a real close look, you can see lots of little bubbles bubbling up to the top. That's all the carbon dioxide being released from the yeast uh, fermenting the wort. And yeah, so it seems to be very happy, uh, which is good. Started a fast fermentation. That's very good. That ensures that the yeast taken hold of the wort and that nothing else funky like a wild yeast or bacteria will be able to get a good foothold for any type of contamination. So looking forward to this one finishing up in a week or so. If you'd like to get started and learn how to make your own ale at home, here are a few tips from the Cardboard Junkies. So yeah, for uh, Birmingham, the local homebrew shop I like to go to is Alibrew over in Pelham. So they're very helpful and you can get everything you need started from uh, you're just a base kit for brewing beer from one gallon batches uh, all the way up to 
doing 10 gallon batches or so. And once you're once you're all geared up from Alaru and you want to come hang out with people who can show you what to do with all your fancy gear, how do they get involved with Carboys Junkies? So uh, you can email me at j.p.bennett at me.com, Nick Hudson. You can email uh, info at carboyjunkies.net. You can go to carboyjunkies.net, and that takes you there. We have a Yahoo groups uh, email group uh, that everybody's on, and we have a Facebook group. Uh, all that's available from the website. We'll have links to all this and more in the show notes for today's episode, so be sure you check that out to learn more. That's it for this week here at Experience Shakespeare. I'm Cassie Cash, that's Shakespeare Girl, and I hope you learn something new about the Bard. See, See you next, next week! week.